Hi, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you and uh, these esteemed panelists. Thank you so much, everyone, for being part of this discussion. There is a ton to talk about. Um, I think we'll have no shortage of topics. Um, maybe, Greg, uh, I would lead off with you and just kind of ask you a little bit about the market conditions that we're facing right now. I mean, we've obviously got high valuations in the stock market. We're up, I think, about 12% or so since the election alone. Um, some people feel like it's getting a little toppy. Um, the deal flow numbers are up for the first quarter, although according to the Wall Street Journal, we're hitting some, some rough spots. What do we make of the macro picture here, and how eager are companies to do deals right now? Well, there's uh, a lot of uncertainty in terms of a whole variety of factors that impact the doability of deals and also the valuation of deals. And boards tend to be cautious in that environment. So most likely is we wait for resolution on tax policy and a whole other series of regulatory rulings, and we wait for healthcare policy to be determined. Uh, there are a whole series of issues that just go straight to the willingness of folks to take on risk and the likelihood that they could look silly uh, announcing a deal or closing a deal. So we're seeing a little bit of hesitation, and that'll probably play through until we have resolution of some of the, you know, particularly you know, U.S. and European political issues. Steve, you guys did a, a client survey recently that had some interesting results. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the idea was that about 56% of your clients were expecting to do some sort of deal, an acquisition, in the yes. coming 12 months. Yes. Walk us through your results and what you make, both data-wise and anecdotally, of that. Sure. So this is our capital confidence barometer that we put out every six months. And we survey 2,300 C-suite executives around the world, very comprehensive, a lot of interviews. And we talk to our clients. There's clients and non-clients. And it's really interesting, because what they're saying, and I'll maybe a little different than, than uh, the original comment, is green light for deal-making. Um, and there's three data points that are very telling. First is geopolitical concerns are absolutely um, a big deal. And if you ask them, what's your top economic risk? 70% are saying it's geopolitical. But 60 plus percent, 64% believe the economy is improving, and to your point, 56% plan to do a deal in the next 12 months. And that's one of the highest numbers we've ever seen. And it's consistent with the kind of deal flow that we're seeing, frankly. So what it tells me is that companies are fighting through the geopolitical uncertainty because technological change is so significant, and the need to grow your business, protect your business, often with acquisitions, JVs, uh, alliances, it's an imperative. And, and so that, at the end of the day, that imperative is outweighing the geopolitical uncertainty. So technology is going to be a driver that, that persists regardless of right. political conditions. That's right. Um, is, that, is tech specifically an area to focus on, or you're just talking about all sorts of companies because We're, everybody has look, to use it? it, it it's, it's every sector. And as I was telling you earlier, I'd like to say elections mm -hmm. happen every four years we are in the fourth industrial revolution of the history of the world, right? And that is the more significant impact on businesses right now. And it's impacting every sector, whether it's tech across automotive, tech across consumer. You look at a lot of the consumer deals being done, they're tech influenced, getting into new sales channels. It's impacting you know, life sciences as you develop into precision medicine, industrial products, agriculture. So it's, you can't really find a sector that's not impacted by technology. Virginie, uh, you're as AO, uh, just opened up an office in New York relatively recently. You are running that effort. Um, you've got dry powder to work with. Uh, you're on the hunt for deals in the U.S. How are you finding the deal landscape to be, and what are you guys looking for at the moment? Uh, right, I mean, once uh, we have a bit more clarity on the uncertainties that we were referring to earlier, which are you know, well beyond just the uncertainties in the U.S., uh, we have some French election coming up, some other election in the UK, but I think overall you see um, a globalization of most of our, the businesses in which we've invested, uh, consumer, business services, you know, across the sectors. So you certainly have a need to be much more global these days. Um, you know, being European, having to establish a presence in the US, I think is pretty key. And vice versa, it will, you know, it will also happen. Um, so we're, we're bringing you know, our knowledge of the European market, which is a difficult market to penetrate, understand, you know, super different from one country to another, regulation, DNA, culture. 
Um, but we're also, you know, bringing, um, you know, a presence outside Europe. You know, we have a small presence in China and in Sao Paulo. So internationalization, I think, is what counts. And then what's driving our efforts is also to be looking for growth. I mean, what, what we've been lacking in Europe, although I'm certainly much more positive, um, you know, these days than we've been a few years ago, is growth. Um, so when you're, when you're desperate as an investor or as a company to be extending uh, your market, of course, you know, M&A is an answer that, you know, could really you know, move you fast in other countries, uh, taking the risk aside, of course, but so you'll see more and more of that coming. Um, and I think, you know, technology is a big driver of M&A, but in consumer, which is an area that we like as an investor, you see, you know, in food, in fashion, in beauty, many of the big strategic players buying, you know, small brands, authentic, you know, natural, you know, you know, different kinds of, but actually buying into much smaller brands, which are not all tech, you know, emerging brands um, that they have had difficulty to, you know, see emerge in their own environment that, that they have to go and, and, and buy. So that's a pretty big trend across all consumer sector, which is interesting as a driver to M&A, for yeah. sure. No, no question, as customer preferences are changing, yeah. they're staying on top. And that's true everywhere, in, you know, in Korea, in Europe, in the States, that's all across the segments, all across the world. Leon, <laughs> yes, How, how's the health of the deal market from your perspective? And what buckets are we seeing the most activity in? Um, is it mid-sized deals? Is it super big deals? Is it cross-border transactions? I mean, what are the trends so far this year? I think the trends are, to echo some of the other comments, if you look at what's happening this year, it's still a bit of a year of uncertainty. And so from a volume standpoint, the volumes were okay during the first quarter, but more importantly, I think there's a lot of uncertainty. People do not necessarily know what's going to happen in tax policy. They don't necessarily know what's going to happen in areas relating to currency exchange rates and capital inflows. So I think as a result, there is pent up demand but I don't think you're going to see much in the way of very large transactions until some more certainty comes in. Then you have a few other trends. Obviously, a year ago, last quarter, we had a large amount of outbound M&A from China. That's slowed down significantly at this point in time. You've also had companies, as I think my colleagues were saying, concentrating on areas that have got nothing to do with the economy, interest rates, and currencies. And those two areas are fundamentally healthcare and technology. And if you look what's going on in the tech business right now, there's not a single large company in the US globally that is not focused on tech disruption at the CEO and board level and figuring out what M&A transactions they need to do. So even companies with very large market caps will have CEO and chairman focus on relatively small transactions because they're strategically important. That's a big trend. Biotech, we've seen a number of transactions going on. Those are variations of the same theme with people in effect buying other research that they can find. That's going to continue on here for a while. Either to improve efficiency or to fill out areas of the business it's that are really to improve. lacking. It, these are all variations on themes. In other words, you know, p buying a phase two or phase three biotech product in a company here right now is a variation of not having put money into that area of research in your own company. You simply bought it elsewhere. The same thing on the tech side of the equation. And I think what people are working out very carefully, and we've seen that from other panels with the folks from Auto and other companies like that, is how you incorporate this startup cultural component into very large companies. And I think time will tell how all of that works because it's not the easiest thing to have people that have built entrepreneurial companies and then go get sold to XYZ large company. And then their first phone call will be from the HR department who wants them to fill in forms. <laughs> so that's gonna go. And then last but not least, and then we'll turn to your side of it, is, uh, is obviously what's going on in the energy patch. And we talked about that earlier on here. You know, the U.S. onshore shale revolution continues, costs came down, and I think we all feel that there was an acceleration here of activity here as energy prices recovered. 
cost of extraction came down and that business continues to explode. So I think we need to wait, let's see a few more months, let's stabilize, make sure there's no fat tail risk, and then I think we'll start to see more and more transactions, but they're going to be very focused, and I don't think they'll be necessarily big deals, but they'll be very strategic. I know we, we talked about this, and the 1 to 10 billion range is where we're seeing the, the real activity. Right? Oh, yeah. Not as many mega deals, to your point. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. John, I want to hear how things look from your vantage point, and I'm curious also how your clients are feeling about the cost of capital and whether it's going to continue to be relatively low or, or what's sort of the runway for getting deals done if they need financing. Look, cost of capital has been low, and it's been low for much longer than I would have expected. Um, and so if you look at post-crisis M&A and, and the capital markets, with the exception of a few brief periods, um, leverage has been, you know, bountiful, uh, to put it mildly, right? So when you talk about m and I think you need to break it up into a couple different categories, right? You've got large strategic, you've got less large corporate activity, and then you've got this whole other constituent, which is private equity world, right? So, um, you know, the, 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 the activity level, you know, sub $5 billion has been incredibly robust. Um, th- there is ample capital, uh, both on the equity side and the debt side, to support that activity. It is, I think, much less um, sensitive to the big macro issues, geopolitical concerns, uncertainty. Um, Uncertainty is the enemy of large strategic M&A, and I think that's why you've seen the large cap deals slow down. Um, They've certainly slowed down since since the fourth quarter and even, you know, going back to the first quarter of last year. Um, So, but, but... but the reality is it's still a pretty strong pace by historical standards. Um, so the activity levels have been pretty good. And, um, you know, I think uh, absent some unforeseen shock to the system, they will continue to be good. Yeah, it, it all suggests that if we can get to a place that a whole bunch of the current issues are settled down, whether it's, uh, you know, what are health care costs going to look like, uh, what does tax policy look like? And that's everything from corporate tax rates to, you know, some ideas that have been floated from border-adjusted taxes or uh, deductibility of interest, uh, all of which would have radical impacts on what a deal looks like and what price one might pay and how one might finance it. Once that's settled, the, the pent-up demand that was referred to, Combined with what everybody expects to be a more benign regulatory environment for most types of transactions and for most business operations, uh, I believe will probably lead to several years of record M&A volumes yeah. across the board. And it's, it's interesting because it will be, you know, the, the big corporate move or strategic move will be then fueling um, the private equity investment because some businesses become non-core because of, you know, big transaction, you know, whatever the size, the 10 mm-hmm. billion ish, or of course the much bigger. And then as a consequence, we've seen that across, you know, decades, you know, when you have merger or significant acquisition by strategic buyers, then they're selling off some, some assets, which most of the time private equity, you know, are buyers of mm. because they're under invested businesses, you know, under managed most of the time because little attention was given within the big corporate groups. So that also should be a very interesting, you know, fuel of additional M&A activity going forward. And uh, Virginia, so that's pretty right. positive. Yeah, I mean, there's a point on that, Virginia, which is also, which I know we, we all feel strongly about, and that is the continued rise of corporate activism, which is actually no longer called activist, but, you know, constructive capitalists. I mean, there's all sorts mm-hmm. of different ways of looking at Suggestivist. it. Suggestivists. Suggestion providers. Um, <laughs> has given rise to companies being much more inclined to look at their own businesses and say, what, would, what could someone say about us if they came on the outside? Where are the areas of weakness that they could point at? And let's make sure we get there before someone else pushes us and embarrasses us. So I think going back on Virginie's point, with you know, S&Ps at record levels, an IPO market that's you know, alive and doing better, certainly than it was a year ago here right now, private equity being strong, companies are ensuring that if there are moves they have to make, they're going to do them ahead. They're not going to end up finding out that they got pushed to make a move 
by people that came into their boardroom that they didn't necessarily want to have. Sure, and there's an expanding group of service providers uh, whose whole intent is to help companies wave that off before it happens, right? To make sure that they're making the moves toward growth, uh, toward greater efficiencies, toward having a, a dynamic board that's a yep. real check on executive authority and so on. You'd be um, surprised how many companies have got game plans in place that are 100 page game plans that are say, this is what we need to do and here's what we can do ahead of time and Playing here's what offense. we'll do at the time, exactly. Right. And you're seeing activism you know, take hold in Europe and across Asia as well. It may not be called activism, uh, but it's happening. And you know, I, someone asked me a question yesterday, is, is activism been good or bad? What's the net net? And to your point, Leon, I mean, if it's helping companies take an outside-in look, that's not bad. Well, one trend that's interesting, we've written about this in the New York Times and other places have written about it too, is, is this sort of current flavor of acti activism is such that not only might you have a hedge fund or you know, a, a deep-pocketed individual agitating for reforms, you might actually have Newberger Berman or Capital yep. Research or you know, one of these more traditional um, mutual we, funds. We saw it last week. I mean, Jana Associates on Whole Foods. Sure. Followed up by oh, Newberger. Newberger, yeah. right. more conventional name writing, an equally interesting letter. Right. So, I think you'll see more and more of that potentially occurring. They don't want to just sit back and wait. Is that because investors are more restless? I think they're quite happy to have activists lead the charge, and if they see a situation like Whole Foods, where Newberger had a substantial investment and wasn't happy with it. Um, the activists are quite happy to step into the fray if they see the, exactly. if they see the industrial logic of whatever it is, a, a transaction, uh, operational improvement, and it only seems like a natural linkage of um, like-minded investors, one perhaps being uh, a little more vocal, uh, but the other um, adding some, some heft to uh, the concept. So think, just speculating for a second, uh, what, what's the chance that Whole Foods has to take some of these suggestions and implement them on a scale of one to 10? <laughs> oh, high, <laughs> very uh, high. Yeah, I mean, but, that, but that's, by the way, that's not necessarily, my comment isn't necessarily specific to Whole Foods. To Whole Foods. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the reality of <laughs> gonna, uh, the landscape. They're gonna withdraw your card for shopping there, you're out. The, the activists, um, look, it's a very accepted asset class today with good returns. Um, and the reality is they uh, invest a, a fair amount of human capital into their analysis. So when they show up, they are well informed, mm -hmm. whether it is an operational argument or a strategic arg argument, as in you have this division, uh, it's undervalued in the umbrella of the whole company, so unlock that value, or you need to do some sort of yeah. consolidating transaction, whatever it may be. They, that business has evolved to a point where they are, they are very well armed. They have consultants who are working with them, developing these reports. And I'm talking about big brand name consultant yeah. firms. And let's be clear, I mean, uh, uh, in, in some cases, some of those strategic owners do not sell non-core assets because at the level of interest rate today, if you don't have an immediate reuse of that cash, you know, if it sits on your balance sheet with no return, and the last thing that most of the corporate wants to do is to dividend back through sort of exceptional dividend or, you know, share buyback the cash. So you have this sort of, you know, balance between selling some of your assets, which you know are non-core and you should be selling, but reuse of that cash that you want, you know, as a strategic, you know, players, you want to reuse, you make, you know, strategic acquisition. So there's also the timing of being able to roll out and balance your invest, divestment and investment. And sometimes, you know, some of the activists step in <laughs> and their patience, you know, is not... You know, you're right, Virginia, <laughs> but I think also, I think DuPont was probably one of the biggest warning shots that ever occurred. You know, to have one of, you know, the great companies, you know, have a proxy battle occur, mm -hmm. win the proxy battle, mm -hmm. but, you know, potentially lose the ultimate war. You know, in other words, the CEO was replaced, they ended up doing a wholesale merger. And I think what's happened is, is no company right now feels that size is a protection. No. Yeah, no it's a absolutely. very, very right. different scenario. It used to be, and I think you were correct in saying, the research that these folks do is much more in depth than what you would have seen 10 years ago, which would have been lever up your well, company. Also, it's availability of data, transparency of data, right? And there's more benchmarks, you can do better analysis. And 
But again, the net net, and you said it, Virginia, companies are more actively managing their portfolios because of this. And, and again, to me, that's a good outcome. The, the, the good ones were pretty good along back 10 years ago, too. I think you see the long only investors more willing to be vocal now, in part because the stigma is gone. The world has just changed. They're not afraid of being treated or grouped with activist investors. And in fact, uh, as the activist asset class has outperformed most others, they're actually kind of happy to be viewed as having a little bit of energy and being willing to push a little bit to make their point. Mm -hmm. um, and we've seen that over and over. There's for a long time been, been a willingness of tra many traditional long only investors to be behind activists, even give ideas to activists, tell them they'll support them. What's kind of new is that they're doing it publicly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Greg, you started to talk a little bit about the current policy regime. I mean, obviously, there's a ton of uncertainty, not just in the U.S., and I, I want to spend a few minutes on Asia and Europe as well, but um, in the U.S., for example, uh, we got a one-page outline last week of what a uh, Trump administration uh, tax reform package might look like. Mm -hmm. uh, corporate taxes, 15%. Uh, pass-throughs, 15%, uh, lower personal income tax rate. Um, it, how do your clients feel about this? Were they expecting such a cut? Do they expect that such a cut will survive? And how does that affect their decision-making, or at least their thinking about it, because I realize that it's so early, uh, when it comes to making transactions, cross-border especially? Well, um, I think generally speaking, I read a phrase, uh, not sure where, about the wet blanket of regulations being removed and the salutary effect that's having on corporations, on planning, on corporate boardrooms and willingness to invest. And I think that that will be reflected in M&A volumes. I think it will probably be reflected in equity values as well. And it probably makes it more likely that the equity values that are today perceived as high will be justified. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of international, I mean, there's a whole lot of speculation. If our tax rate's 15%, some companies that inverted might uninvert. I'm not sure what the word is. Uh, maybe they don't go that far. Yeah, maybe if you invert twice, you're back where you were. Um, uh, but, but it does make planning just a little bit difficult if you don't know what the tax, you know, if you don't know what a given dollar of revenue or EBITDA is going to turn into on the bottom line, uh, it makes it hard to know what you should pay for something. And you can hedge it in certain ways. Stock for stock is less risky. Uh, but uh, how you finance, I mean, if there's a chance of interest deductibility being limited or eliminated, which has been raised, I don't think that was on the one pager, uh, that's going to have a lot of impact on how you finance transactions, particularly highly levered ones. You know, back a while ago, there was an attempt to impact deductibility of interest with something called the HIDO rules, which effectively treated high, you know, certain. Uh, deferred interest and, in, you know, basically zero coupon uh, as, uh, as equity for tax purposes, if you see, and it, and it impacted capital structures. That was back a long time ago. But if interest is non-deductible, if corporate tax rates dropped horrendously, if, you know, there, there were winners and losers industry-wise, it, it seems like there's less banding about of a border-adjusted tax, but uh, we've looked at things where if there were a border-adjusted tax, yeah, a given company is probably worth a lot less money and another company is probably worth a lot more money. But it's hard to know where that lands, so it's hard to know what you would pay for either. Virginie, you have yeah, a thought on this? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, the way I see it as an investor is, I think the question around this panel is also, where are we in the cycle and how expensive or relatively expensive the assets are? At least that's the way, you know, I'm asking myself every day, you know, are we making a mistake in buying those assets at that level of price? Uh, not actually, we're not pushing you know, leverage too strongly, but some of my competitors do. So, of course, that puts pressure on the assets. So the question is more, you know, would that tax reform here in the U.S. and, of course, the significant investment in infrastructure, and you have many of those questions um, also in Europe, also in China, whether you know we can be confident that some more growth is you know is here to stay economic growth both in the US and of course in Europe because if that's the case then you're feeling more 
comfortable about you know the value that you're paying these days in terms of multiple of earnings and you know making sure that you have a few at least a few years ahead of you in terms of growth so that's the way you know i see the uncertainty and the necessity of being reassured that that, that tax reform and the investment that have been promised in the us would effectively happen because the growth itself is better than in Europe, uh, but was you know, not so excited during the first quarter in the US. So it's very little growth, in fact. So the reality is that I'm just, you know, we're asking ourselves as investors, <coughs> where are we in, in that cycle and what risk are we effectively taking in you know, buying some of these assets at you know, all-time prices? Mm. Um, we've been more of a sellers than buyers over the last two years. I mean, we sold for 2.5 billion euro of assets and bought for a billion two, a billion three. Um, but then there's this question of, you know, being able to reinvest your capital, reinvest your fund, whoever you are. And that's, that's I think that's more the, the concern that investors have these days. Um, where are we going from here? Uh, where are we in the cycle? You know, this, this question of growth is an interesting one because um, we have had in the United States such incredibly tepid growth um, for the last, well, really since the recovery, right? Yeah. Um, and that has been probably the principal catalyst for strategic M&A because uh, top line growth in the low single digits was the norm for a lot of industries. Mm -hmm. And the only way to turbocharge earnings was to combine with somebody. Um, so you saw a lot of uh, strategic consolidation plays. You saw some geographic plays. Uh, so it's interesting if, if, uh, if the economy starts growing at a rate that perhaps is well in excess of where we are, it could have the opposite impact on M&A potentially. I, I'd like to think maybe not, but um, we as practitioners have definitely been the beneficiaries of a low growth environment. Well, I yeah. wonder if the Trump administration has a chilling effect on M&A in another respect, which is uh, with the emphasis on jobs, either keeping jobs on shore or creating new jobs. If you're a private equity firm that wants to take a company private and perhaps try to make it more efficient and streamlined by eliminating jobs, um, if you are a, a company that wants to do an acquisition and then start to uh, move operations offshore to a, to a market that's cheaper for you in terms of labor or other expenses. You may not want to do that. You may not want to be shamed on Twitter. You may not want to face uh, scrutiny. Um, is that weighing on clients, do you think? Uh, I think in a perhaps small way. I, I've heard of instances, uh, sort of anecdotally, where somebody might have felt that an action like that would put themselves you know, in the spotlight and maybe they didn't want to be there right now. On the other hand, private equity um, comes in all shapes and sizes and it's not just about making companies more efficient. There are a ton of private equity firms that'll buy a company as a platform and in the life of that investment, buy seven other companies and transform it. So. Uh, I think they're probably much less concerned about it. If, if, if the current administration has an impact on m and I would say uh, in, in a non-political way, um, it, uncertainty, uh, risk, volatility, uh, those are the things that conspire against m and activity, particularly in corporate boardrooms. So when you look at the geopolitical situation around the world, it is perhaps a little different than it was a year or two ago, right? Just take North Korea, for mm -hmm. example. Um, if that situation gets more tense, it could have an impact on M&A, but there might be a handful of other things that could as well. On the other hand, I think, I think that may be right, but on the other hand, there is a very decent feeling in corporate boardrooms and with CEOs that this feels like, and it's a, a very business-friendly environment. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I think absolutely. We, and I think we can't underemphasize that. And at the moment, it's only feelings, but uh, whether it manifests itself in less regulation, we'll see. Whether it manifests itself in an easier regulatory environment and some of the things that, that Greg touched on earlier on here right now, there's no doubt that people feel that they have a voice that is being listened to. Time will tell how it all works out, but I think the reality of the matter is 
as we get into the back half of the year and some of these issues start to be much clearer, you will start to see a lot more activity occurring. And I think the compensating factor for some of the issues that you correctly raised is people will feel more comfortable potentially factoring in more economically aggressive growth rates than they have to date. Because otherwise, they're simply doing cost-cutting transactions, and this may not be the environment to go do those. Yeah. This, was, this was a question, by the way, that we specifically had in our capital confidence barometer. What do you think the impact of the new administration will be on M&A? And mm -hmm. the answer actually was slightly positive. Mm -hmm. So more, much more positive than, than negative. Um, and, you know, I think, I, I agree. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of deals sidelined because companies are concerned that they can't lay off or can't relocate workers. In fact, a lot of the deals we're seeing that we talked about earlier are about market access, shift in consumer preferences. They're yeah. about top line synergies as much or more than they are about bottom line synergies or, or cost synergies. So I think that's how... You know. But okay. there's if, no if doubt, our... on the other hand, on cross-border transactions, without getting into specific, people are thinking about what will be the reaction to what I'm thinking about. As a, and, you know, we all know what that, you know, how will this be viewed? How are people going to look at me? And how do I do it in a way that is regarded as being most friendly vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, the U.S. environment? So that is a consideration that probably wouldn't have been discussed as much potentially a few years ago. And it's well, why, why don't we get into that specifically? Because it's interesting. Um, you know, there's clearly going to be more focus on certain countries doing certain types of deals in the U.S., uh, I don't know whether there will be more scrutiny of transactions that cost U.S. jobs that are intra-U.S. deals as opposed to from the outside, uh, from, from international buyers, but, but it's certainly a concern. Uh, the way CFIUS has been applied has changed recently in response to largely Chinese semiconductor acquisitions. Uh, there have been suggestions that CFIUS be expanded to include things like economic harm or reciprocity with other countries. Uh, there have been suggestions to broaden it to include things like food security. All, all of those things could dampen, chill, threaten uh, cross-border M&A into the U.S. Uh, I think pretty clearly things involving uh, and, and how much of this do the change administration, but, but uh, there's definitely a heightened sensitivity to uh, defense concerns. Well, let's talk more about geopolitics and their impact on cross-border deals. Steve, curious for your perspective, you're London-based, running a global practice. Um, what is the current thinking, and again, I know it's very early, but on Brexit and what impact they may have, that may have on deal-making <coughs> with with, between the UK and continental Europe or with the US. And then, of course, we also have uncertainty in France. And on Sunday, we'll have the next round of the French elections. Uh, the implied probability of a Macron victory is quite high. So that would seem to be a market-friendly outcome. But still, uh, there are other elections later this year. We have continued uncertainty there. Yeah, it's been really interesting observing the whole Brexit sequence um, in, in the UK. And you know, when the vote happened, right, there was so much surprise in the market. And we had probably four to six weeks of a real, real slowdown. But you know, we were talking about this earlier. I call it a pause, right? It, it wasn't anything permanent. It was a pause. And you will see a pause around some of these elections. But in the long term, the UK has always been a leading economy with top talent, top IP, great companies. Same can be said of France. And you know, while you might see some uncertainty around the timing of these elections, the four to six weeks, um, I don't believe that the outcomes are dramatically shaping or shifting the M&A market. It was funny, when, when Brexit first hit, I remember our UK practice came to us and said, we need to lower our plan. And we said, no, let's not do that yet. Let's hold on. Let's, you know, let's see how things materialize. And guess what? We didn't need to lower the plan. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you have to keep a, you know, take a, try to take a 12-month view at least and, and uh, not get caught up in what will happen over a four- to six-week period around. And you could even argue um, that it's a very good time to buy sterling, sterling sure. denominated companies. Sure, can. correct. So, of course, you have to be pretty courageous, and that brings me to, you know, being contrarian. That's where you make the best investment, the best deals, is where you come in 
in, you know, either counter-cyclical or, you know, with some form of courage because mm. you have to bet on the way a currency would go or an economy would go or a sector. Uh, but I'm, you know, I think it's a good time to buy sterling denominated companies because, you know, I think the Brexit will be, you know, intelligently negotiated yeah. and there is, you know, strong talent and capital in, in the UK that you may want to have access to now rather than two years down the road. No, there's no doubt. And I mean, Brexit surprised many people, you know, not necessarily from my standpoint because I traveled a, a bunch in the north of England and heard it but a number of companies turned around in the US and they had looked at targets and they said, you know, the sterling rate has dropped here X amount and some of them made moves, especially when sterling depreciated and the income flow of the company they were buying was not necessarily in sterling. And we've seen obviously, you know, Fox, you know, in the process of consolidating out Sky Broadcasting. So I think you will get depending on the outcome of these, you will get some short-term moves. People will take mm -hmm. something that they've been looking at for two or three years, and they'll say, you know what, the time is right. We can absolutely do it. It's a window of opportunity. Yeah. You know, and I think that will occur here. But I think just stepping back, though, on the U.S. here right now, the other issue, it will be, you know, what ends up happening to the FTC? How does that ultimately start to shake out? How will people be looking at transactions going forward? So part of it will be you know, advisors and lawyers and others getting a feel for what this environment is really going to look like and how things are going to play out. And that, I think, will, you know, will not happen overnight. I, I think you're right. And I think if you look at all these themes together, there's a lot of things that, that still need to gel. Um, if you talk about domestic, you're talking about regulatory reform, you're talking about tax reform, um, you're talking about a number of things in Europe. You've got elections. You've got Brexit. There's a lot of things that need to play out, and um, it will take a little time to get a window on that. Yeah. I don't think this tax situation is going to play out particularly quickly. I think it was a, a bit of a straw man to see where, uh, where uh, like minds, you know, get, get their hands around things. But, but if it plays out, and if there's a more benign environment, broadly speaking, tax, regulatory, across the board, more pro-business, generally speaking. Um, and if, at the same time, we see global, global growth return to the top line in a way we haven't seen really since the crisis, um, things are in place for a rise in equity values and, generally speaking, M&A volumes accompany equity values. So uh, if that all comes to pass, you could probably count on a lot more M&A. So I know we've got differing views up here about how concerned uh, clients are about the uncertainty or the issue of jobs and so on. But um, I'm just curious, it does, this all feels to me like it's arguing for a bit of a lull in activity while people take a wait and see attitude. No? Yes. I, and I know you had your survey results that said otherwise. Well, it's not just a survey, frankly. It's what we're seeing in the market and the pipeline. I, I don't see the lull, actually. I mean, we've seen private equity come back stronger. We've seen Europe come back stronger. And the question is, can you afford to wait, mm -hmm. right? Can you afford to wait, you know, to see what gets hammered out over the next 12 months mm -hmm. on the tax front or in the U.S. or wherever it may be, what happens with the elections in France or Brexit? And in some cases, you know, waiting probably isn't the right answer. And I think, you know, we are... We are seeing a pickup in GDP. There's no question about that. But is it enough to really slow volumes, uh, M&A volumes? I don't, you know, I don't think it's going to. No, be not enough. yet. I think, look, yeah. look, I've yet to look. If a company has a great strategic opportunity that is reasonably unique, they're not waiting. Mm -hmm. They will go ahead and do it. You're still financing in a very, very low interest rate right. environment relative. Literally, you can't afford to wait. You literally can't afford to wait here right now. Rates of return are still very attractive to be able to finance they will still go ahead and do it. Yeah. But at the same time, you will not see things, in my opinion, for a while in the mega transaction area until, you know, we obviously saw the attempt to transaction on Unilever, mm -hmm. which was highly unusual. But I'm saying things like that will not necessarily happen here for a while until people have gotten some comfort on the environment. But on the other side, as you said, 10 billion and under, 
will just keep going. Yeah, yeah. there was one on very that. big change in 2017, which is, you know, Chinese outbound investments. Right. That's an True. enormous change. So China's yeah. put some constraints no, I'm on I'm thinking of, you know, the mega deals because last year China invested 250 billion outbound. Correct. But right. one deal made a force of that, like, what, 20, 25 percent, which was China came buying Syngenta. Mm -hmm. That was right. 45 billion, uh, probably, dollars. So that, that is a big change in 2017 since sort of November last year. Um, What's happening in China though now? The control on you know, capital yeah. outflow is very serious. Mm -hmm. um, well, so you just came from a trip to China, right? What you're is the consolidation now in right. China and the consolidation of the SOEs and it's more in-country activity than outbound. What were your observations being there recently? I mean, are people focused on this and when do you think uh, the policy may change? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I actually flew from China directly to, you know, to LA. Um, you know, every single meeting with either SOEs or privately owned companies, strategic or private equity, uh, you know, there's not one meeting where, you know, capital control is not mentioned. So basically either those investors or those players have platform in, uh, you know, um, foreign currency denominated platform in Hong Kong or otherwise, and they can continue to invest. Or it's not the case, and most of the time it's not the case, and there will be no deal authorized by, um, you know, the government, with a few exceptions from what we understand, which are the super strategic move. And, you know, the way they're, they're super organized and super competitive because uh, one player in one industry not only is consolidating its industry locally, but they're authorized by the government to move outbound and continue to consolidate, you know, in the US or in Europe. So they're sort of selected by the government to be, you know, the consolidator in an industry. And we see that, you know, across the board in different sectors. I, you know, I think based on what I heard, so it's not me saying, it's what I, you know, I gather from that sort of one week in, in, in China that they're expecting or maybe they're hoping that when Xi Jinping is re-elected, you know, in fall this year, they will be, they will be loosening up, you know, that you know, heavy control of capital and that a lot of because effort... Because the political be, pressure is off. Sorry? Because the political pressure is off. Because he's, he's going to be, yeah, because political pressure is off and, you know, they're only elected for two terms, as you know, so 10 years altogether uh, and that a lot will be done to re, you know, re sort of in, initiate the growth in, uh, domestically and then loosen up, you know, the capital. I mean, the, the concern was the level of the foreign reserve, which I think last year was four trillion or probably at the end of 2015 and went down to sort of 2.5 in just a year and a half. So they had to stop that you know, serious outbound investment to also protect their foreign you know, currency reserves. Yeah, and reserve it for things that are strategically important. Exactly. And, and you know, there's certain sectors obviously that will continue to be that way, whether it's food, natural resources, things of that nature. There's other things that probably can yeah. wait. And I think we'll see them waiting on things like that. Yeah. Well, you're hitting, you're hitting on a topic, which is capital flight versus strategic investment right. in industries that China as a country wants yeah. to have access to outside of China, particularly given the fact that their economy has slowed down some. So they want to diversify. And that's clearly going to be a strategic imperative, I think, over the long haul. You know, maybe a bit of a hiatus now. But if you look out, you know, 5, 10, 15 years, that, that's absolutely going to continue. But they wanted to stem the... Exactly. Flight. Yeah. yeah. When it comes back to the topic of mega deals uh, and policy, I'm just curious to the panel, how do you guys think about a, a Time Warner AT&T deal right now? I mean, the, the day or the day after it was announced, mm -hmm. uh, campaigning Donald Trump said this is exactly the kind of deal that he would never allow to go forward as president. Uh, earlier this year, he was sending similar signals. Um, he has appointed um, a regulator to the DOJ who's regarded as pretty moderate, so now people are a little more encouraged. I mean, how do you read the tea leaves here, and does this have any uh, implications for other mega deals? You mean on that deal specifically, or...? Both. Now, I know you, <laughs> we can you're attached to that one. We're, right? attached, we're attached to that one, so... But I would love to hear others on that deal as well as yours on the landscape. Well, look, look, I think the jury's out. I mean, I, I just don't think we know enough right now. Um, 
you know, Hart Scott review of deals is moving slowly, um, and and there are positions to be filled. And uh, one man's view is we don't really know where they're coming down or what the target industries are going to be. Uh, I don't know if my fellow panelists agree with that. I, I agree, and you've seen tougher um, challenges in Europe too. I mean, you know, some of the regulatory hurdles that. You know, down to pond transaction had to get through, for example, or, you know, we're, we're not easy. And so it's going to continue to be a tough environment. I don't think we have a crystal ball on sort of what the antitrust future will look like six months from now or 12 months from now. There, there was a peak in with, withdrawn deals last year. Um, and as various regulators were in their last stretch, uh, were more assertive. I think it would be surprising if we see anything like that in the next four years. Mm. Yeah. But I, look, but I, again, you need to see exactly what the makeup will be of the commission. There's some cases that are still there that need to actually get resolved. There's still a few, potential, a few pending transactions that are still sitting there. Once people start to get a feel for it here right now, they will see exactly what the environment is that's in place. There's still a lot of positions, I think you said, that have to be filled. You know, the staff positions need to be filled. When all that occurs and you hopefully start to see transactions actually moving through the Python and getting approved, then I think people will have a better feel. At the moment, it's still a little bit uncertain here. And, and there are some things that have been in there for quite a while. I do think the CFIUS topic is an interesting one, though, that, that was brought up earlier, mm -hmm. because CFIUS has a long arm and, and is able to reach into situations that I think many people thought maybe they didn't have purview over. And that's one where I could see perhaps more activity, uh, just given you know, the administration's stance on political you know, regimes across the world. It's also I, I noticed that, that Stephen Mnuchin made mention of CFIUS mm. in his mm. remarks yesterday. Okay. I mean, from my experience in, in Europe, uh, some of the sort of antitrust body, either national or at the European level, have taken a pretty sort of serious stance against consolidation when there was significant worry about impact on the consumer purchasing power. Mm. Um, so everything which would, you know, put at risk, um, you know, price competition uh, of, you know, consumer products or, you know, telecom, uh, you know, um, you know, or, or media, music, uh, you know, movies, everything which would, you know, had another layer of, you know, uh, pressure on the purchasing power of the end consumer, you know, in France or otherwise, would be blocked. Um, and and that, that was a pretty sort of new trend over the last few years. And of course, there was this willingness of, you know, being able or avoiding another layer of pressure on already, you know, pretty low growth environment and low, grow, low you know, purchasing power environments. Um, so I don't know whether that may, you know, be the sort of same trend being followed in the U.S. Well, I've even seen not, some situations in Europe where they're looking at, the regulators are looking into R&D pipelines and what that might mean to future mm -hmm. products and pricing on future yeah. products. So they're, they're, they're always looking at, at risks to innovation. They worry about innovation, R&D cuts, things that are going to stop the next product from coming out that would be competitive or something else. Mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, the, the, it, it's interesting. So if you look at the recent cycle, and I think we're largely in agreement about what's going on in the world and the impact on M&A, if you look at it compared to prior cycles, mo most things have come back. There are some nuances. You know, in the last bunch of years, things were inversion-driven for a while. There was a lot of M&A out of China for a while, or within China. But the one thing that really hasn't come back that was critical to the last cycle was the financial sponsor club deal. Mm. Uh, last year, there were no financial sponsor club deal. There, there, was, there were no financial sponsor deals over $5 billion. And if you go back to 07, I, I don't know what the number was, but, but there were a mm. significant number of deals, and deals were hitting you know, $40 billion with, with three or four different funds writing $2 billion yeah. equity checks and That's all gone. investors coming around the side. Um, and that, has, that had been a very big driver, yeah. and I'm not sure that comes back. Well, why well, did it go away? I mean, well, look at, the, look at the multiples right now. I mean, it's one thing if you're doing a stock swap at 15 times cash flow, but if you're 
doing a mega transaction and paying, you know, 14, 15, 16 times EBITDA and you can leverage it five or six, just be, these are big equity checks. Mm -hmm. And I'm not so certain that anyone is going to be in a position where they want to go do a club deal where three people are each putting in $5 billion. That starts to be a little bit uncomfortable. So it, it, look, if, if, you, if you believe some of the things we've been speculating about, that some of the changes in the world lead to greater growth, that would suggest that multiples are coming down, it would suggest that leverage will delever faster than it might appear. It feels a little bit like maybe coming out of a recession where it's a question of, okay, who's the first person to move and take the risk that we're really out of it and pipelines are going to turn up and then you start to see another boom to the upturn. The financial sponsor club issue is a little bit different. Some of it is sponsors not wanting to dilute their brand. Uh, some of it, some questions around collusion last cycle. Yeah, uh, I mean, some, you know, some of it is... We've when, been through cycle and, you know, having a, a sort of common position amongst three investors, let's, let's say, in a club deal, when you go through cycle and, you know, the three investors do not have the same agenda, they may not have the, main, the same firepower. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we, the lesson learned from the 206 and 207 investment is probably that you're better, you know, you're better off with just one captain in the cockpit, so at least you know where you're going, <laughs> or, or, or you're, you know, you're, you're taking charge of the situation and your own, your own, your own decision maker. If you have partners, of, you know, of the, the magnitude that we're talking about for the club deals, then it, it makes your life, you know, much more difficult. No, that's with, that's very true. As opposed to, you know, the VC industry that has been used to for years doing club transactions, oh, yeah. multiple people investing here right now. That's the history of 06 and 07 wasn't the best. And mm. I think given where the multiple stand right now, at least I don't see it coming here for a while. Certainly not on anything of right. size. Well, the other thing you've seen is the emergence of limited partners wanting to co-invest in a pretty, in a pretty large way. Yeah. So they're there to provide ample amounts of capital um, without yeah. some of that um, potential clash as to who's leading the charge. And that's, that's been a huge phenomenon um, in the last uh, three or four years. Um, so I don't, I don't see that stopping either because there's some economic advantages uh, to, to the limiteds to, to invest that way. John, what in your estimation is the most interesting sector or part of the world to keep an eye on in the coming 12 months? Boy. From an M&A perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could probably give you five answers to that. But one thing that has astounded me is just the rebound of, of the energy sector and shale in particular. We've seen that in our business. Uh, you know, when oil prices, you know, when the, when the bottom fell out, um, there were a lot of shale transactions that obviously went sideways. So there were bankruptcies, there were assets that got traded out at valuations that were dramatically lower than they were acquired at. Um, there were yeah. very large scale transactions of shale players that went into the big name oil companies um, where, you know, 18, 24 months after they acquired them, you know, those companies were literally worth maybe 30 to 40% of what, what they paid. Now, the reality is after, I think, an incredibly short period of time, we were, debating this earlier, I don't know whether it was nine months or 12 months, we started to see that, that um, well, obviously as oil prices recovered, but the, the M&A market followed extremely quickly and the activity level in the last 12 months has been breathtaking. So there's this seismic shift in, in oil and gas where conventional is, is um, really being squeezed down and people are playing in shale, in particular in the Permian. They're getting away from risky areas like Africa, um, Australia, maybe I wouldn't put in the same terms, but um, the, you know, the pendulum has swung there and the activity level is, is incredible. So we've got 60 seconds left. Other, other thoughts on like the most interesting thing to look out for in the coming year or yeah. so? I think one place, everyone, and there's been a lot of it going on at the conference, just 
as a completely different M&A thought is just the word mobility, mm. which you know we're spending a lot of time on inside of City thinking about, and it aff- and it is a much much broader topic than self-driving cars. You know, from mm-hmm. insurance to finance, the areas that it touches are profound. So I see that as being one of the interesting areas here going forward that people need to think about the full ramifications of that. All right. Well, very good. Thanks everyone for being here, and thanks Thank to our you. audience. Thank you.